Oh, it's our joy this morning to return to our studies in the book of Acts, where we begin a new chapter, which is not anything by way of a break in subject or the flow of things. And I'll show you how it connects in just a moment. But last week, thinking I might preach on what we covered last week and what we're aiming for today, I invented the term spiritual software update. I did that to describe some of what was happening during the transition era that is recorded in the book of Acts. And we're in the midst of three examples of people or groups that reflect how that transition played out. We saw the example of Paul in Acts 18, verses 18 through 23. He actually participated in a Nazarite vow, not because he was still loyal to the law. He was a full New Covenant, New Testament saint, but he was wanting to demonstrate to his Jewish friends that he was not abandoning them. He loved them, he respected them, and he wanted them to come to faith in Messiah, which is the next logical step get that spiritual upgrade, that, that spiritual software uh, upgrade. And there I called Paul the transitional species. Well, next we come to two examples of Old Testament believers, other Old Testament believers, who had partial information but weren't yet saved. So in a, in a sense, they were more transitional species than was Paul because the transition was complete um, in, in Paul but these needed to put their trust completely and exclusively in Christ. So that's what I meant by a spiritual software update. After I introduced that uh, analogy of needing a spiritual software update, uh, after church, uh, someone suggested to me that, well, I should just keep that analogy going. And now that we have the final spiritual software update, we're just waiting to be uploaded to the cloud. <laughs> now, I won't mention Hunter by name, but he, somebody here has a brain that works as silly as mine does, but that's actually pretty good because if we live till that day, we will meet the Lord in the air. Well, here are these two uh, eight more examples. Update number one guarantees a secure connection it's an upgrade to Jesus' death and resurrection. And this one is about a highly gifted Jewish scholar and teacher named Apollos. He was a Hellenistic Jew. That means a Greek-speaking Jew, one born outside of Israel. He had grown up in a significant Jewish um, community in Alexandria, Egypt. He somehow found his way to Ephesus, and he was teaching there among the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. But he was acquainted only with the ministry of John the Baptist, and he'd been baptized only with John's baptism in keeping with repentance. So Paul's new ministry friends, Aquila and Priscilla, whom he had dropped off in Ephesus as he passed through there toward the end of his second missionary journey, they took Apollos aside and uh, gave him further instruction, and he immediately accepted the spiritual software update, guaranteeing him that secure, eternal connection to God through uh, Jesus Christ. Apollos went on to minister in Corinth for some time. Right away, he wanted to go from Ephesus over to Corinth. The church at Corinth sent him uh, recommendation letters. Well, Apollos had, had known that Jesus was the one promised by God. So he was sort of in a, in a stage of uh, uh, arrested development. He knew about John the Baptist, the only, the, the, the last, the first prophet in over 400 years. He knew the baptism of John, so he'd been baptized by John. He must have known maybe that John had introduced Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, but he hadn't le yet learned about all that Jesus did and about his death and burial and resurrection and ascension to the Father. So he, he also didn't know about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Well, the next one that we come to is a, a, a similar situation, update number two. This installs the Holy Spirit, and it takes all the way from John the Baptist to Jesus. There's great similarity between Apollos and the 12 men that we're going to meet uh, today. But in this one, there's a greater emphasis on the ministry of the Holy Spirit and 
I wanted to be able to spend a sufficient amount of time today because this passage today has profound applications to some doctrinal aberrations that we are faced with in our times. Let me explain this to you. Stay with me, give you a little historical background, and we'll pull it all together uh, in Acts 19 and, and elsewhere. There are a number of groups these days which teach that the baptism of the Holy Spirit or the indwelling of the Holy Spirit comes as a dramatic experience subsequent to the time when a person comes to know Christ by faith, separating, therefore, the baptism of the Holy Spirit or the coming of the Holy Spirit with salvation, not the same time, not the same event that they say. Now, there are several variations of that. Shows up in several different pockets of churches. Many of them are in the holiness movement. That would include uh, Christian brothers and sisters such as Nazarenes, Christian and Missionary Alliance, uh, Church of God, Methodist, Wesleyan, and there are other wrinkles of that as well. Out of 18th century Methodism and Wesleyanism, Methodism the denomination, Wesleyanism named after John and Charles Wesley, but out of 18th century Methodism and Wesleyanism sprang the Pentecostal denomination, which began in 1901. The key leaders were a man named Charles Parham, not related to our Parham family, and William Seymour. Pentecostalism believes that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is essential for salvation, but it is distinct from and subsequent to water baptism. So it's not one, not all of it happens on one day. It's like a two-part conversion that they proclaim. Now related to them, the Assemblies of God denomination began in 1914. It branched off from Pentecostalism, but they are very, very similar. The Assemblies of God says that speaking in tongues, as they describe the phenomenon of glossolalia, they say that speaking in tongues is the single and clear initial physical evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and it is required in order to be a Christian. So you have to speak in tongues in order to be a Christian, according to Assemblies of God. Then there's the, the Foursquare Church. That was yet another branch in the same part of the family tree. That was the product of the ministry of a woman preacher named Amy Semple McPherson, who founded Angelus Temple in Los Angeles in the 1920s. She claimed to be a faith healer. She taught that physical healing is included in the atonement and pretty much everything else that you would find in the Assemblies of God and Pentecostalism. The modern charismatic movement took many of those same beliefs out of the realm of the Pentecostal circles and brought them into mainstream evangelicalism, and that took place about 1960. Now, in all three of those circles, and the several others like them, People who have professed Christ are strongly urged to or required to learn how to speak in tongues, as they say. What they are taught to do is to repeat syllables over and over, empty their minds, so don't do anything cognition uh, associated with this, but the result is that they have this phenomenon, they practice this phenomenon, but they are not ever able to speak in languages, human languages, that they have not learned. And that's what the gift of tongues is. In Acts chapter 2, when the gift of tongues was first, uh, was first given, it was the ability to speak in a language you have not learned. And the languages are even named there what they are. So when that gift is, uh, is practiced, it can always be attested to and verified by native speakers who hear the word in or hear whatever is said in their language. Now, I went to that bastion of theological wisdom, Wikipedia, 
I, I did it on purpose because I wanted to come, use a source that did not have an ax to grind on, a, on the theological spectrum of charismatic to non-charismatic. Wikipedia has an accurate definition of the phenomenon which is now, since 1901, called speaking in tongues. Here's what Wikipedia says. Speaking in tongues, also known as glossolalia, there's your fancy word for the day, you know what it means? The Greek word glossa is tongue, the Greek word laleo is speak, tongue speaking, speaking in tongues, that's just the word for it. It is an activity or practice in which people utter words or speech-like sounds often thought by believers to be languages unknown to the speaker. One definition used by linguists, so notice this has been investigated by linguists who have validated it's not language. All right, one definition used by linguists is the fluid vocalizing of speech-like syllables that lack any readily comprehended meaning. Now, they were not talking about presidential debates. That's a whole <laughs> different subject that you can also look up on Wikipedia. Now, in other words, and by the way, on either side, I heard nonsense in a lot of directions. In other words, so-called speaking in tongues is... I'll use another word that I don't mean pejoratively. It's gibberish. Uh, but that's an accurate description of the phenomenon which people are taught to produce. So, go back to um, Brother Pedia, and he says, gibberish, also known as, I'm full of theological words today, jibber-jabber or gobbledygook is speech that is nonsense. So it's vocal, but it doesn't communicate anything. Ranging across speech sounds that are not actual words, pseudo-words, language games, and specialized jargon that, that seems nonsensical to outsiders. So by well-meaning people, many of whom are brothers and sisters in Christ. I mean, you could walk into most Foursquare churches, uh, Pentecostal churches, uh, um, whatever the other one, Assemblies of God churches, and say, I, I, I'm, I'm concerned for my soul. Can I be saved from the, from the horrors of hell? You'll probably hear the gospel, the right gospel, that the only right way, the only way is through Jesus Christ and His death, burial, and, and resurrection. So, you, you know, I'm not, I, I have no um, hostility toward these people, but there's an understanding of several biblical things that is not uh, accurate there. Well-meaning people who say that this phenomenon of glossolalia, gl glossolalia is necessary or at least highly advised for Christians, they'll often call it a prayer language, and in many circles people are encouraged to pray in that way, even though Paul said, pray with your understanding, never mind that, or it's also called a heavenly language. You know, we, we, we're just not able to understand it because it's, it's beyond us. Uh, they use that terminology. You can go look up our sermons on 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 if you want to study more of that in the context of Paul's teaching on spiritual gifts. But back to our point, why do I want to massage this a little bit in Acts 19? Well, the Pentecostal denomination, Assemblies of God denomination, Foursquare Church, they and those like them, which um, uh, are still very, quite common in the world, and now many of those teachings uh, not bounded by those denominational boundaries in the charismatic movement, um, they, the essence of it is that they teach that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is separate from salvation. It's subsequent to conversion. Now, if you get over into the um, Wesleyan holiness uh, uh, circles, they tend to refer to a second blessing. Uh, some say that you aren't saved until you have the second blessing or you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Some would say, well, you are saved, but you're kind of second class until you get the second blessing and you're not empowered for holy living and for effectively serving God. Uh, until you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And some of them, as I said, insist that you must learn to speak in tongues and you must pray in tongues. Now, some even teach that the second blessing includes full deliverance from sin or complete sanctification. 
Or it's even been called sinless perfection, that you achieve a point where you stop sinning. Um, Now, that terminology grew out of some teaching from John Wesley, but it goes way further than anything that John Wesley uh, ever taught. But the point I want you to get is that all such groups teach the baptism of the Holy Spirit is separate from conversion. And the reason I bring that up now is in our passage for this morning is a statement or is a, a, a section that is used supposedly as the proof that you can be a Christian and not have the Holy Spirit. And that is not true. So they say this passage is the definitive proof, proof, and they make this passage normative as is, this is the way it is for every Christian everywhere, in every language, in every country, in every era for the entire history of the church. And anything that says differently, they overrule it by this passage. This passage can trump uh, the other ones. So it's a, a, a case of uh, very flawed hermeneutics, very flawed interpretation of Scripture, but we'll see what the passage actually uh, says. So I'm going to m- take a little bit of time here, and this is the reason why I tried not to, st- I didn't d- try to squeeze it in last week. I wanted to help you um, um, be able to respond lovingly and accurately when you hear this passage misused. Now, in Apollos' case, the step up to faith and his move to Corinth took place while Paul wasn't there. He was still on his way there through Galatia and Phrygia on his way to Ephesus. And by the way, you might have noticed this morning in our uh, Scripture reading when we began the book of First Peter, Peter wrote to people and he names all of those places. All of those places are places that Paul had been on his first missionary journey, and his second missionary journey, and his third missionary journey. And you say, I didn't know Peter was with Paul. We don't know that Peter was with Paul. Peter probably wasn't with Paul. They ministered to, they both ministered to people in that whole region. And so, uh, the, the, the synchronicity between Peter and Paul is astounding. And that's just a, that's just a sidebar there. But as we come to Acts chapter 19, you'll see specifically Paul wasn't in Ephesus when Apollos got saved there. Chapter 19, verse 1. It happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, now remember he got saved in chapter 18, then he wanted to go to Corinth. Well, while he went there, Paul passed through the upper country, that's the portion of Asia Minor or modern Turkey, north of Ephesus. So he started in Antioch of Syria and he went up north and then kind of arced over west and then back down south to get to Ephesus. Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples. Now, when you read that and you see the phrase, found some disciples, From the way that we generally use the word disciple, which is the way that it's generally used in the New Testament, you might think he came and found some Christians there. But in this case, you would not be correct. Uh, The word disciple comes from the Greek word for learn. So it's a learner or a follower. And usually it is used of a disciple. We, we say when you become a Christian, you become a disciple of Jesus Christ. That is absolutely true. But we'll see that these men were disciples, uh, disciples of John the Baptist. Uh, disciple just means a, a follower <coughs> or a learner. Uh, Jewish rabbis had disciples. Be, Jesus had his disciples. But we even know that many who were willing to be called disciples of Jesus turned their backs and walked away when he started talking about serious commitment. John chapter 6, many of his disciples were not walking with him any longer. Well, the same guy that wrote that in John wrote later, they went out from us because they were not of us, and if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. So a true disciple belongs to Jesus Christ. That's the general way we use the word. But here, these were people among the disciples, but they didn't have the um, the, the full understanding of the gospel. And just by way of curiosity, there were actually pockets of followers of John the Baptist all the way up into the second century. So this wasn't all that bizarre of a thing. Now, we aren't told exactly what made Paul 
uh, suspect they weren't Christians, but it's right, quite clear he recognized they weren't. This is another group like Apollos. They were Old Testament believers who were zealous, but without the full knowledge of the truth about Jesus. So Paul's question to them and their very delightfully honest reply tells us this group needed a spiritual software update that would transform them forever and give them eternal life in Christ. So look at verses 2 and 3. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, No, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, Into what then were you baptized? And they said, Into John's baptism. So they, they were sort of frozen in time. Whenever it was, wherever it was that they had met John the Baptist, they were close enough to him to hear what he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They were close enough to have been baptized by John. And uh, as Apollos was telling people, Jesus is the Messiah, maybe they heard that as well. But then, however it happened, they didn't hear about Jesus in his ministry, weren't followers of him during his, uh, his ministry, but they were zealously wanting to do what God wanted them to do. So Paul didn't beat around the bush with them. He told them immediately in his own words, you need a spiritual software update. You need a complete reboot that will bring you into eternal life. And the one that they were waiting for is Jesus. So verse 4 of chapter 19, Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him, that is, in Jesus. We read from Luke's gospel last week that uh, John's baptism was to prepare a people for the Lord, for the Messiah. And that's where they were. They were ready for him, just hadn't heard of him, didn't know about the Holy Spirit, didn't know what had happened in Acts chapter 2. But their response was wonderful, and it was immediate. Verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Didn't take any persuading. <laughs> Just give them the right information. And the Holy Spirit drew them to himself. Now, why do we think these weren't Christians? Well, first of all, the word disciple doesn't have to mean Christian, but I will admit it usually does. And I remember reading through this the first time I went through the book of Acts, and I thought, wow, what what's going on there? The, you know, these Christians, and they didn't have the Holy Spirit. Well, think back to the pattern that we've now seen in many situations in the book of Acts. And by the way, it's going to continue all the way through the book of Acts. Verse 5 here, when they heard this, what? They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. All through the book of Acts, when someone hears the gospel and repents and believes in Christ, they are baptized immediately. Now, we don't do it that way. I confess that. Um, some, some churches do, especially some of the churches uh, that, I could name names, but I won't, that, that believe that you must be baptized in water in order to be saved. They got the tank full every single Sunday just in case somebody repents. They don't want to let them go out the door without getting water baptized because they wouldn't be saved. Okay, well, uh, well, we want to guard against that kind of thinking. We want to make sure that we don't baptize false converts. And so it's a little different in our time, in our place. I'm not going to say that one is better or worse. I'm just going to say they are different. But in the early church, hear the gospel, repent, believe in Christ, get baptized immediately. Even if it's three thousand people on one day. The idea of a Christian not baptized in the name of Christ was totally unheard of. So when they hadn't been baptized in the name of Christ, they're saying, we don't believe in Christ. Yet, tell us about him. Oh, that's who we're waiting for. Bring it on. Where's the water? I'm in. So 
they were not Christians. They were sincere. They were seeking the true God, but they weren't yet Christians. By the way, they were in a time of, well, transition. They'd heard about the last prophet of the Old Testament. They had not heard about the Holy Spirit of the New Covenant in the New Testament. And you remember when um, the gospel first went to the Samaritans back in Acts chapter 8? God made sure that some of the apostles were present before he gave the Holy Spirit to the newly believing Samaritans. And then he gave them the same miraculous signs that he gave to the first Jewish believers in Acts chapter 2. But he wanted to make sure that the, the apostles witnessed that. And their message was, guys, they got exactly the same thing we did. There's no difference. Same gospel, same conversion, same salvation, same Holy Spirit. Very same thing happened in chapter 10 in the home of Cornelius. Remember, Peter was the one who preached the gospel for the first time to a group of Gentiles. They believed, and the same thing. The Holy Spirit was given to them in that similar manner to what it was in Acts chapter 2 so that the apostles could confirm it's the same for the Jews and the Samaritans and the Gentiles. It's kind of like we're taking the gospel to Jerusalem and Judea and then Samaria and to the remotest parts of the earth. This is the work of God to bring all people into one body in Christ by exactly the same gospel and the same Holy Spirit at work. So, I started thinking about this. This group, they were zealous. They were telling people about uh, John. They were possibly even like Apollos, telling people that Jesus is the Messiah, and now they, they come to know Him, and they're saved. It, it, it's in the white spaces here in Acts 19. We're not told, but I started thinking, just imagine their testimonies in the synagogue the next Sabbath. Can you imagine what glorious um, testimony that must have been? And who knows how many these 12 men quickly brought to Christ. Now, understand, Paul had not yet written Romans or 1 Corinthians. He'd started writing. He'd, he'd written the book of Galatians by now, and, or the letter to the Galatians. He had possibly written 1 Thessalonians, maybe 2 Thessalonians, but his writing career was still you know, yet to blossom. But he understood what he was going to write. And he understood there's no such thing as a Christian without the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to emphasize it again, and it might sound like I keep emphasizing it a lot because I keep emphasizing it a lot. You need to understand the difference between Acts, this book, and the epistles, the book of Romans and beyond in your New Testament. Acts is the only pure book of history. The Gospels are a very specialized history of just the ministry of Jesus. The book of Acts is the historical record of what happened between the ascension of Jesus and the, uh, basically the end of the ministry of the Apostle Paul. It takes us through those years from the ascension of Jesus almost to the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. That was slamming the door on the Old Testament era. The door to the New Testament era, the New Covenant era, had been opened up with the coming of the Holy Spirit. There's this transition with people at various stages of spiritual development along the way. The book of Acts tells us inerrantly what happened during that time. The normative, definitive books for the sound doctrine of the faith, which is once for all handed down to the saints, that's not from the book of Acts. That's from the writings of the New Testament that deal with doctrine. The books of, book of Acts is narrative, and there are some, some um, little snippets of doctrine in there. The epistles are primarily doctrine, and there are some little snippets of historical information embedded uh, among them. But what you have in Acts is what happened. What you have in 
the epistles is what is normative, what is for everybody, what is true uh, all of the time. And if you see something that doesn't exactly match, well, then the question is, which verse can beat up the other verse? It's the way some people do it. And our charismatic Pentecostal Assemblies of God, Foursquare, and such brethren take Acts 19 and say, that's normative, that's the way it always is for everyone. First you become a Christian, then later you receive the Holy Spirit. And if you show me a verse that says otherwise, I'll tell you, that's not what it means. Well, that's not how it works. It's not whose verse can beat up the other's verse, not which verse trumps the other verse. It's how do these things harmonize because they are all from the mind of God. Well, what you have is normative, and you have some exceptions to what is now normative. Why the exceptions? And we can see exactly why. So the apostles can testify that everyone has received exactly the same gift. So the experiences recorded in Acts, they're very important, but they don't define doctrine once for all. Now, the book of Romans is the fullest expression of doctrine in the New, in the New Testament. Probably Romans has the most doctrine. Hebrew, Hebrews is going to come along a close second. There's a lot of doctrine elsewhere. Colossians is not nearly as long, but boy, it's intense in the doctrine. So is Ephesians, especially the first three chapters. But we go to the doctrinal ses- sections, such as Romans chapter 8, verse 9. Uh, verse nine. Scott Basolo and I have even talked about um, uh, maybe uh, doing a, a little series sometime on, uh, on Romans chapter 8 and, um, uh, and, and explaining all this there, just a little mini-series. We haven't yet worked out when to do it. Go ahead and read it if you, if you want to. But um, by the way, I skipped verses 6 and 7 in chapter 19. Let's go back there. When Paul laid his hands upon them, The Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. There were in all about 12 men. So um, God again made sure that the apostle witnessed exactly the same phenomena with this group, a group of Old Testament believers who had become Christians, as with the Gentiles who had become Christians, as with the Samaritans who had become Christians, as with the Jews who had uh, become Christians. Christians. Now, let's go over to um, Romans chapter 8 and verse 9. Paul writes this, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Now, he's defining two kinds of people here. The only two kinds of people there are, Christians and non-Christians, saved and lost. If you are in the flesh, that means you're under the control of the flesh. If you're in the spirit, you are owned by the Spirit. Those are Christians, non-Christians, flesh or spirit. It's a dichotomy. It's through the whole chapter. You can see that on your own. But he clarifies, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. And then he clarifies, but if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. So, Was Apollo saved before Aquila and Priscilla got to him? No. He didn't have the Holy Spirit. Were these 12 men saved before Paul taught them? No. They didn't have the Holy Spirit. Were you saved before you received the Holy Spirit? No, because you received the Holy Spirit when you received Christ. Package deal. You get a lot when you receive Christ. But you get indwelt by the Holy Spirit. So how do you reconcile that crystal clear, unambiguous statement, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong with him. How do you reconcile that with our text in Acts 19? Well, for one, the 12 men in Acts 19 didn't have the gospel yet. They were still Old Testament believers, if you will. Their conversion came in the midst of this transition from Judaism to Christianity, from Old Covenant to New Covenant, it's here to show us how this transition worked out. 
in several different uh, examples. And it's not a case of whose passage trumps the other. How do they fit together? Here's another one. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. Paul writes, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. Now I need to explain the theological significance of that little three-letter word, all. It means all, each one, everyone, every single one of you, no exceptions. This is true of every single Christian, everywhere, every language, any country, any time. It's always true. By one Spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. How many Christians don't have the Holy Spirit? Zero, none, not any, ever, not anywhere. Okay, this is the norm. When you receive Christ, you are baptized into the body of Christ by the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and you receive the Holy Spirit. What a great metaphor. We've been made to drink of one Spirit. We have all imbibed the same Spirit. We've received the same Spirit. He indwells us. The only conditions for receiving the Holy Spirit, Romans 8 or 1 Corinthians 12, is believe in Jesus Christ. No ceremonies, no rituals, no crying, no praying, no crisis experience. Well, it is a change of life to come to Christ. You come to Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit, and then the changed life unfolds. Then you begin to manifest the fruit of uh, the Holy Spirit. You know, it was probably the most... No, I don't, don't think probably... The church in Corinth was the most troubled church with the most problems and the most stinkers among the Christians there. And he says, you all have the same spirit. So every Christian has the spirit. Now, true speaking in tongues has not happened since the days of the apostles. Glossolalia, however, that phenomenon of the, of the speech-like pseudo-words, as Wikipedia described it, that has been among the practices of many theologically aberrant groups, and even in some cases among cults. Uh, it's a powerful experience, I hear. It is often associated with a sense of euphoria, but it just isn't the ability to speak in known languages unknown to the speaker. I, I've ministered for countless hours in Russia, and I need a translator all the time. Oh, God, how, would, how wonderful if I could just think in English, open my mouth, and it comes out in Russian. We could do twice as much without the interrupter stopping me every few sentences. That doesn't work. It doesn't happen. It just isn't. It was a miracle for a period during the transition. But people today are taught how to speak in tongues. If it can be taught, by definition, it isn't a miracle. A miracle is something that transcends normal activity. Somebody gave me one, you know, here's how you can start making the sounds, and they say you'll get used to it, you'll catch on, you'll get better and better at it. Well, you can practice most anything and get better and better at it. Somebody told me one time, here's something you can say about a Honda should about a Yamaha. <laughs> that sounds kind of like English, didn't it? Well, some of the things I say do sound kind of like English once in a while. But you can start making sounds, and it's interesting some people are taught to speak in tongues by someone with a foreign accent. 
And so what I just said, you could go off from there and start making a whole bunch of, uh, of sounds that mostly had uh, soft A vowels in them and smooth consonants in them. And you could, you could kind of sound like you're speaking a language or you could do something that sounds maybe like Spanish, maybe like, um, uh, like Akkadian, maybe like Swahili. Uh, you can make sounds like language and they're, not care, and they're not language. So Acts 19 is constantly used within the charismatic and Pentecostal circles and other groups I've mentioned to support the idea you first become a Christian, later you receive a second blessing of receiving the Holy Spirit. But that just isn't the case. There are only four times that it happened in the book of Acts they are recorded for our edification, and it's explained that in every case, the apostles then explained to the other groups, we all have the same gift. Now, don't miss the implication of the fact that these teachings about the Holy Spirit coming subsequent to uh, salvation were not in existence until 1901. What about all the believers prior to that time? It's a completely self-defeating bit of reasoning to say, well, and, and actually they will explain it. The, the church uh, lost its way. The Holy Spirit lost control when man usurped control of the church and it was finally recovered in the early 1900s. Our Mormon friends say exactly the same thing about the Book of Mormon, and you read in that, and everybody that has preached any of these things, and, and anybody who does preach anything other than our gospel, they're all, uh, they're all phonies. They're all abominations in the sight of God. No, God has been building His church from the beginning, nonstop, good times, bad times, more, less, a remarkable um, uh, thing happening in the 16th century with the Protestant Reformation, but there were true believers all through all of those centuries. So, you receive the Holy Spirit when you receive Christ, and that's just as it was promised. If you look at Ezekiel's description of what was coming in the New Covenants in Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27, Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Remember, in the flesh, in the spirit. Where did he get that terminology? Right there, Old Testament. He says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. There's no conditions on that promise. God says, when this time comes, I'm doing it. You believe in me? you get it. Or consider the way Jesus said it at the Feast of Booths in John chapter 7. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus um, stood out or stood and cried out saying, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Same terminology, we're all made to drink of the same spirit. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were yet to receive, for the Spirit had not, was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. John's writing about this from way back. John wrote this about uh, 40 years after the book of Acts was, uh, was, was all wrapped up. Well, about 30 years after the book of Acts, Acts was all wrapped up. And what does he say? Only condition, believe in him. You believe in Him, you receive the Spirit. Believe in Him, you receive salvation. Believe in Him, you receive adoption. Believe in Him, you receive justification. Believe in Him, you receive sanctification. It's all a package deal. He who believes in me. Before He went to the cross, the night before He went to the cross, Jesus said in John 14, I will ask the Father and He will give you another helper that He may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit has always been present with you. He's going to be in the next era in you. 
the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now, back to our comparison with software updates. Well, with software and the hardware that it runs on your computer, there comes that dreaded point when um, your hardware is obsolete or it breaks down and the manufacturer no longer supports it or the software that you've used and mastered, it's no longer supported. But in this spiritual analogy, when your hardware fails, you go home to be with the Lord. That's good. That's a great thing. But there's something very different about your spiritual software. Once you have Christ and you have the ultimate update, you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You have the completed Word of God at your disposal. You are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Or as we saw in First Peter this morning, you have a, a, an inheritance imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away, and you are kept to receive it by the power of the Holy Spirit. So you have a secure connection with God for eternity, including resurrection to eternal life. You have the Holy Spirit living in you forever in Christ, and He is the only way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through Him. But once you come to Him, you need to understand God's explanation of what it means to be in Christ. And as I said last week, if you ever did have a package in which your spiritual software update was contained, it would probably say something like this, all other versions of spiritual software are not supported by our Creator. Anything else you know, anything else you believe, there's one and only one way to have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So, you believed in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit, you want to have the fullest possible experience, the greatest joy? Well, believe in, in Jesus, repent, call out to Him, and then let the Holy Spirit control you. Famous passage, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, Paul uses this remarkable compare and contrast. Don't be drunk. That's a total waste of time. It's dissipation. Don't yield control of your thinking and your actions to anything, drugs, alcohol, whatever. But on the other hand, yield control to the Holy Spirit. So do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he gives five participles to describe it. Speaking, singing, making melody, giving thanks, and being subject. You, you, you gather with God's people, you, you praise Him with one voice, you, you, are, you become thankful, and you subject yourself to one another. You, you, you serve one another. You consider everyone else more important than you. Or another way that Paul put it, Galatians 5, 16, but I say, walk by the Spirit. When you walk, it implies you're expending energy, you're going somewhere, you're picking up one foot, putting it in front of the other, you're walking. How do you do it? By the Spirit. And you won't carry out the desires of your old life in the flesh. Well, how do you do that? Well, as you walk, you make constant decisions over and over to choose to do the things that the Spirit wants to produce through you, which is later in that same passage, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. You want to be more Spirit-filled? There's your things-to-do list. Love, joy, peace. You know, not... Not impatience, not rudeness, not naughtiness, not dropping the ball, but faithfulness. Not, not, not crushing your enemies, but gentleness, self-control. The Holy Spirit wants to produce all those things in your life, and He's willing. And so the question is, is your spiritual software fully updated? 
Do you have version Eternity 1.0? That's the only one you will ever have, the only one you will ever need in Christ. And let's pray. Our Father, again, we just fall on our knees and we say thank you for your astounding grace to us in Christ. Lord, there may be people around us still clinging to old traditions. They need that update. They need the Savior. There may be people who have some of the truth about Christ but don't understand the, the fullness and the sufficiency and the efficacy of His death and resurrection. Help us to speak the truth to them in love. There may be some of us indwelt by your Holy Spirit, but stubbornly clinging to activities and attitudes that come from the flesh. Please, in your grace, give us wisdom to choose that which pleases you above all things. Please don't let a person leave this place today apart from eternal life in Christ apart from the indwelling of your Holy Spirit and send us then with the message to those around us who so desperately need this Savior in whose name we pray, amen.